Welcome back to another episode of For the Glory of God and Kings Reading the Bible for the first time again. I am Travis Finley and uh, welcoming you back to our look at Genesis. <clears throat> A lot of what I uh, do is intended to help us think outside of the box so that we see all that God has for us in His Word because familiarity very often makes us lazy. Uh, we're familiar with stories and so we don't really look for anything more than what's on the surface. And um, <clears throat> so I want to offer up a lot of suggestions for us to try and, and get as much out of God's Word as we can. When, <clears throat> when I read this, the Narnia series by C.S. Lewis for the first time, I read it in the order in which C.S. Lewis actually wrote it. Right now, if you go to the bookstore and you buy the set, there is going to be one book that is out of order. When I first read the series, The Magician's Nephew, which is chronologically before everything else, was book five. So I read The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, The Voyage of the Dawn Treader, <clears throat> Prince Caspian, The Silver Chair, and then The Magician's Nephew. And you can imagine, if you're familiar with the set at all, you can imagine what happened because The Magician's Nephew explains how Narnia started and how it all began. But it was, it was the fifth book in the series. And even right now as I'm thinking about that profundity, I had, I've got chills because of how profound it was for me to read <clears throat> that material. I, I, I want to make a suggestion to, to some extent that that might be the way that we could consider the book of Genesis. That um, if, I were, if I were going to um, start preaching for the first time at a church, say I got hired by the church and I was going to start preaching for the first time, where would I start preaching from? I don't know that I would start in Genesis. I would probably start in Deuteronomy or Exodus um, because I think a lot of those connections that happen in those books when you then go back into Genesis and you're familiar with the story in Exodus and Deuteronomy and Numbers and Leviticus even, the, the knowledge that you have from that dislocation, if you were to do things out of order, and then go into Genesis, you would see things in a different light because you would be familiar with ideas that Genesis uses and seeing it from a different perspective, I think, would be helpful. So, part of what I'm arguing for, at least with Genesis, is that understanding Genesis better, I think, comes from understanding the rest of the Old Testament's story before you get to Genesis. Um, let's, let's say, for instance, you consider the temptation in the garden and the temptation of the serpent. Um, my mind asks this question. What is, what is this serpent? Who is this person? Or who is this thing? And what, I don't, I don't have a context. So if I'm reading Genesis for the first time and I come across this temptation situation, I'm thinking I don't have a context to put this into to understand the story that I'm reading. But I think that if we understood the story of Israel's experience later on in the story, I think that would help us understand what happens in the first few chapters of Genesis. So if we start with the first two few chapters of Genesis, but the way to understand those two chapters, we don't get to that until books and books and books later. It's not very easy to make those connections. So I tend to think that later revelation shines light on previous generation, previous revelation in a more helpful fashion. All right, well, that's enough of that. Um, Genesis 1. We talked about translation before. It is the translator's job to tell you what the text says. It is your job to interpret what it means. This is what the text says. What does this mean? I have made the point a couple of times about the word land in Genesis 1, that the Hebrew word for land is Eretz, 
and the translation in Genesis 1 has both earth and land for the translation of Eris. I would prefer that it was always land. And then the reader determines what kind of land we're talking about if the context calls for us to move to a global picture or a national geograph geographical picture. Uh, to make this point, let's look at the last book of the Bible, and I will show you what I think is a um, analogy to what I'm saying here. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 7 says, Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn on account of him. All the tribes of the earth. Now the same rule is in the Greek. The word that's translated earth is the same word that's translated land. And I'm arguing that it should always just be translated land, and then we should be able to understand from the context what's being talked about. Think about the contrast here in Revelation 1-7. What two different ideas does this conjure up in your mind? If I were to have said, all the tribes of the land will mourn on account of him, what does that conjure up in your mind if you are familiar with the Bible's story of land and tribes? And if we translate it as it is here in the New American Standard, and I think pretty much in all of the, the contemporary translations do this, all the tribes of the earth will mourn. Do those two translations give us a different idea? If the tribes of the, of the earth gives us a global picture and the tribes of the land gives us a geographical national picture, I think that those are two diametrically opposed ideas. If I think one thing here and another thing here, and in the text it gives me one, and I only think of that one thing, I think that that is an unfortunate influence that the translators um, choose to do. Because the whole scripture is concerned with a nation called Israel, and a plot of land that we call Israel as well, I think it's more consistent to translate the word as land so that we keep it within the Bible's parameters. Okay? Hope that makes a little bit of sense from Revelation going back to um, Genesis for um, that point on the land. Okay? Um, one other thing that I want to point out in this, because we're talking about the not just the story itself, but also the theology that comes out of the story. Um, we talk about God being a trinity. There is one true God who exists in three persons. And I want to make a suggestion that we have to read between the lines here because we can see all three persons of the Godhead here. We see in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Okay. And then we see the Spirit of God hovering over the waters. And so we make that distinction between persons. So that in the beginning God created, and then we have the Spirit of God hovering over the waters. And then Jesus is referred to in John as the Word of God, the spoken Word of God. And as you read the Old Testament, you see over and over and over again, the Word of God came to Abram. The Word of God came to Elijah. The Word of God came to this, this, this. Okay, so the, the second person of the, of the Trinity, Jesus, who is God incarnate, the God-man, he is referred to as the Word of God. So here in Genesis 1, we have all three persons present. We have the Spirit of God hovering over the waters, and then we have um, the Word of God spoken. So when it says, and God said, let there be light, that is the spoken word of God, who is the second person of the Trinity. And then we have that connection in John chapter 1. In the beginning, God 
no, I'm sorry, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning, and all things came into being through him. So we have here in Genesis the revelation of the persons of the Trinity. The Spirit is hovering over the waters, the Word of God is spoken in creation, and then also uh, the summary that God created all things in the beginning God created. So there's a, there's a bit of, of uh, an example of what I'm saying that when we read the Bible uh, on the surface, um, we can understand the story it's telling us, but we also have to read between the lines. We have to see a little bit deeper and behind the text to bring out everything that God is trying to reveal to us in these, um, in these stories and in these accounts that he gives us. All right, well, that marks up about uh, 10 to 11 minutes, and I don't want to take it any longer than that. So this is Travis with For the Glory of God and Kings, reading the Bible again for the first time.